What do you think the greatest compliment for the Christian is? Especially in our day and time. The greatest compliment. Is it that you love Jesus? Man, he sure does love the Lord. Is the greatest compliment, man, she goes to church every time the doors are open. I submit to you that the greatest compliment for the Christian is to be known as a disciple of Christ. It's to be known as a learner of his ways, a student of his word, but over the top it means that I'm a follower of his life. After Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, those who were closest to Jesus revealed some incredibly wonderful expressions of love as they followed him. Martha worked. She was serving Jesus. She was serving the disciples. She was serving all those that he was teaching. Mary worshipped. She bowed before the the, the feet of the Lord and she too anointed the feet of Jesus. Now, Lazarus, he witnessed. His life, in effect, was saying, Hey, y'all, I was dead, but because of Jesus, now I live. Amen? Can I tell you that that's your witness too? You were dead in your sins, dead in your transgressions, but because of Jesus, now I live. You live, or at least you can. Amen. But today, in John chapter 12, it's the next day. And John begins by telling us about the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus into Jerusalem. In John chapter 12, I wish you would follow along with me. I didn't get the page in the Bibles in front of you. But I'm going to read beginning in verse 12 from John chapter 12. John writes, it's the next day. And a great multitude had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, and as it is written, said, Fear not, The daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard, because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said amongst themselves, You see, you're accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, my servant will be also. If anyone serves me... Him, my Father, will honor. Friends, if there was ever a time in human history, now is the time to follow the King. The hour has
has come, so I ask you, how do you follow Jesus? How do you follow Jesus? Today I'm going to share with you six different groups of followers, and I pray that you're going to make the right choice about how you are going to follow the Lord Jesus. For you see, our scriptures tell us that there were some who believed only with expectation. Some believed based on expectation. There in verse 12, it's the next day, and the, the great multitude had come to the feast, and they heard, they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And they took those palm tree branches and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And then Jesus, when he had found that young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. So what we have here is thousands of people, thousands of so-called church folk, Thousands of so-called religious people who are clogging the streets of the holy city to participate in this Passover feast. Jesus comes into town and he's sitting on a donkey, which we learned was a prophetic announcement of how the Messiah would come into Jerusalem. So I ask, as they came out to meet him, had the Jews finally concluded that Jesus was their Messiah? Did the Jews finally believe that he was the Christ, he was the one, he was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah of God? Was Jesus finally going to receive the glory due his name? Sadly, the short answer to all those questions is, No, they did not believe that. They shouted, in effect, praise God, our conquering king has finally arrived to unshackle us from the grip of the Roman Empire. They came expecting their freedom from the Romans. Many heard that Jesus was coming. Many more had heard that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. And expectations that something marvelous was getting ready to happen in the streets created this fever pitch in Jerusalem. Something's going to happen. And they were expecting that something. But can I tell you that this group of followers, this multitude, followed Jesus for all the wrong motives. They only believed because they expected to get something in return. Now, before we get too high and mighty, amen, there are many today who claim to believe Jesus. They claim to follow Jesus just so they can get a get-out-of-hell-free card. Do you know those people? Amen, we all do. Furthermore, many others claim to follow Jesus because they expect that if they begin to follow him, maybe they'll receive blessings from him. Maybe I'll have a better life, right? Materially, relationally, maritally. Maybe if I do all those things, I'll get a benefit by following Jesus. Listen, we don't follow Jesus for something we're going to get. We follow Jesus because of what he has already done for us. Amen? That's why we follow. I mean, he's already stepped out of heaven for me. He's already suffered and died for my sins. Jesus has already been resurrected from the grave to prove his victory over my death. So what more could I possibly expect from the Son of God? So, next we see that while some believed in expectation, there were some who understood Only in recollection. Take a look at verse 16. His disciples, of all people, did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, that is, when he was resurrected, then they remembered, then they recalled these things that were written about him 
and that they had done these things to him. Only after Jesus was resurrected from the grave and then ascended to heaven did those who were closest to him begin to understand what was happening to him. Along the way, somehow, they had missed all the scripture, all the evidences that Jesus was who he says he was. All those scriptural evidences that were being fulfilled in Jesus. But after the resurrection, after he was glorified, the words of Jesus, the actions of Jesus, bless you, the miracles of Jesus, and the teachings of Jesus begin to take on a brand new meaning. All of a sudden now, in recollection, all the things that Jesus was doing in their midst began to make sense. They recalled how Jesus helped them to understand the kingdom of heaven. They recalled how Jesus led them into a more intimate relationship with the Father. Friends, just stop and think for a moment. Stop and think about all the events in your life that God has put into place to lead you right where you are today. You are here by God's plan. You are here by God's purpose. Think of those things. All those events in your life. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Amen? The valleys and the mountaintops. All those things that God has done to bring you right where you are. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about all that God has done to bring me to this point? Have you ever thought about it, friend, and said, Lord, Everything that you've done in my life was designed and preordained by your divine purpose to bring me to this point in my life. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But if you have, your next question ought to be the same question that the Apostle Paul asked in the book of Acts. And that is, Lord, what do you want me to do next? You brought me here. You brought me to this point. You brought me to this place. You brought me to this church. Now then, what do you want me to do next? What do you want me to do next? So while these multitudes believed only in expectation, we have those who were closest to Jesus seeing and understanding only in recollection. But we also find that there were some who believed with shallow devotion. Take a look at verse 17. Therefore the people, the crowd, the multitudes, who were with him when he called out Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people, the multitude, also met him. Why? Because they heard. Because they heard that he had done this miracle. He, they'd heard that he had done this sign. So most of those cheering people were only cheering because of this great miracle that Jesus had done by raising Lazarus from the grave. Their commitment lasted about as long as it took for Jesus to pass by on that donkey. Their adoration of Jesus was short-lived. And their commitment to Christ was shallow at best. Because in a few short days, y'all, not a single member of this cheering mass of people would do a single thing to stop the Jews from nailing Jesus to the cross. Not one would take a stand for Jesus. Not as if they could stop Jesus from going to the cross anyway. But no one stood up for him. No one stood up for Christ. Not one. Not one would do anything for the Lord. Why? Well, maybe there are a lot like people today. There are a lot of people who claim to believe. There are a lot of people who claim to follow Jesus Christ. But they're not going to take a stand for him. They're not going to even lift a finger to follow him. They go to church. 
They go to church because they say, well, that's how I was raised. They go to church because maybe they can be seen there. They go to church maybe because they're going to feel guilty if they don't go. So what do they do? They cave in and they go. But simply coming to church without serving the Lord in your life is very shallow devotion. But unfortunately, this is exactly how some people believe. Now, sadly, there are some who give up in desperation. Take a look at verse 19, the Pharisees. Now, these are the religious people. These are the religious leaders. These are the the church leaders, so to speak. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, you see, you're accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. These religious leaders were becoming very desperate men. It seemed that Jesus was becoming more and more popular. And the more they tried to stop Jesus, it seems like the more his impact increased. Can I tell you this? Those who oppose Christ in this world are just spinning their wheels. They're just spinning their wheels. Countless people in centuries past have set out to discredit Jesus. But you know what? They ended up bowing before him. Because you know what the Bible says. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Therefore, I say to you, you might as well confess Jesus is Lord now. Amen. Let's get this over with already. Let's do it today and make sure that he's the Lord of our life. These Pharisees were right when they said, we're accomplishing nothing. We're spinning our wheels. All of our efforts to dishonor this Jesus are getting us nowhere. You see, their plans only succeeded so far as God's plans permitted. Yeah, they ended up having their way, didn't they? Nailing him to the cross. But only so far as God's plans permitted. People can spend their whole lives if they want to resisting Jesus, rebelling against Jesus, refusing a relationship with Jesus, rejecting Jesus outright, but they're only going to discover in the end that they accomplish nothing but their own destruction. That's what they're going to find out. The only thing that these kinds of people are committed to is self. And when they find out that they can't follow Jesus unless self takes a back seat, then they abandon ship and they give up in desperation. Thankfully, there are some who truly, sincerely seek salvation. Let's take a look in verse 20. Now, there were certain Greeks, that's non-Jews, non-religious people, among those who came up to worship at the feast. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. So these non-Jewish, non-religious Greek people coming to Jesus shows us that even if his own countrymen reject him, word's going to get out. Even if Jesus' own people turn their back on him, word's going to get out. The gospel's going to be getting out there. The gospel good news that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried in a criminal's grave, and that he was raised three days later, it's going to get out there. And guess what? Some people are going to believe. The news is going to get out and some people are going to believe it. But I want you to notice their most respectful request. Sirs, we want to see Jesus. Now, you need to understand that that means far more than what it appears on the surface because the original Bible word for that word see means 
to know or to meet or to learn from. So these uh, unchurched people, these unchurched Greeks, come to the disciples of the Lord and they say, we want to know Jesus. They come up to the disciples and they say, we want to meet the Lord. They come up to the disciples of Jesus and they say, we want to learn from the Messiah. Can I tell you that no one who has that sincere kind of desire, that sincere yearning to meet Jesus, to know Jesus, and to learn from Jesus will ever be turned away. It just won't happen. In fact, I believe that true Christian commitment comes out of that kind of sincere yearning to know Jesus, to meet with Jesus on a daily basis, to learn from him, meaning not only that I learn in my brain, but I learn in my deeds. Amen? I live what I learn. I apply what Jesus is teaching me. That kind of sincere yearning is what manifests itself in true Christian commitment. It's the kind of commitment that leads you to ask that question. Lord, what do you want me to do next? Sometimes we as believers, we as followers even, we get so doggone comfortable. And we we push the autopilot button and we just go with the flow. Instead of asking. Lord, what would you have me to do next? What do you want me to do now? Nobody will be turned away who has that kind of desire. So we've seen those who believe in expectation. They understand sometimes only after the fact and recollection. They believe maybe with just shallow devotion but they also give up in desperation. But praise God, some people sincerely seek true salvation. But listen, friends, if we are true believers, if we are true believers on the Lord Jesus Christ, as followers, you and I have an obligation. You and I have an obligation. Let's look in verse 23 where Jesus spells out our obligation. But Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him Follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. In the centuries past, multitudes of people have come to Christ for multitudes of reasons. According to human standards, Jesus was now in the perfect position to overwhelm all those who opposed him. But instead of bringing together all of his followers by force, he said, my hour has come. Here, Jesus is declaring The greatest moment in the history of mankind is just about to take place. It wasn't time for Jesus to take his place as king. No, it was time for his death. His hour of sacrifice had come, but this is exactly why he came. He came to die for you. And then, 
the one who lived out his commands, the ones that he tells us to obey, beautifully illustrates exactly why he must die. You see, a seed of wheat never produces wheat until it first falls to the ground, is buried, and dies. Only when a seed dies will it produce a single blade of wheat. It's got to die first. Of course, Jesus is referring to himself as the seed of wheat. If he didn't die, guess what? He was going to be all alone. He was going to have to enjoy the glories of heaven all by himself if he didn't die for us. If he didn't die, there'd be no saved sinners to share in his glory. But if he did die, if he did sacrifice his life, there would now be a way for sinners to be saved. If he did give up his life, there would now be a way for sinners to be redeemed. If he did give up his life, there would now be a way for sinners to go to heaven. Can I tell you that the same thing applies to us as followers? Unless we refuse to be seeds of wheat, that is, being willing to die to self, unless we're willing to sacrifice our own precious time, unless we're willing to risk being rejected, unless we're willing to do what Jesus tells us to do, unless we're willing to give up everything for the cause of Christ, we're going to be up in heaven all by ourselves. Listen, I love y'all, but I want more people to be with us. Amen? We don't want to be all alone. God is not willing that any should perish. That goes for the worst sinner among us. He's not willing that any should perish. You see, there are many who think the important things in life are food and clothes recreation and pleasure and as a result they live for those things but living their lives this way they're failing to realize that things are temporary things don't last everything that you see is temporary and it will not last listen to me y'all eternal souls last forever Souls are eternal. All the stuff you got, all the stuff you see ain't going to heaven with you. Souls are eternal. The soul of your family members, the souls of those in our workplace, the souls of those in our schools, y'all, are eternal. And if they don't hear the good news of Jesus Christ, they're not going to heaven. They're going to spend eternity somewhere else. And I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. That phrase that Jesus used, hating your life in this world, basically means loving Christ more than your own interests. It means loving eternal souls more than I do my own interests. And I can't speak for you, but what that tells me is that we as followers have got to get our priorities straight. If the Lord did not want you to share the good news of Jesus with other people... You wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. We'd be in heaven together, amen? But there are more people who need to hear the glorious good news. Are you having your priorities straight to make sure they hear that good news? 
If we choose to love our own lives more than we love Christ, if we choose to love our own lives even more than we do the eternal souls of people around us, listen, you're going to lose the very life that you're seeking to maintain. It's just that simple. So how? How do I go about serving the Lord? How can I be that that true follower of Jesus that I really want to be? Well, I'm going to offer you up three quick suggestions. If you want to be a real follower of Jesus, I want to invite you to adopt a couple of really radical lifestyle changes. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. Here we go. Adopt a lifestyle change of no excuses. Listen to what Jesus said in verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. Friend, are you willing to give up your life to be the kind of follower of Jesus you want to be? No excuses. Number two, adopt a radical lifestyle of no limits. No limits. Look in verse 25. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Are you willing to get your priorities straight as a follower of Jesus? No excuses, no limits, and as a result, you'll have no regrets. Verse 26, our Savior said, if anyone serves me, Let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Can you imagine the father honoring you? Because you live this radical lifestyle of no excuses and no limits to follow Jesus Christ. Friend, what is your life? What are your goals in this life? What are your interests? What kind of hobbies do you have? What are the career choices you've made? What kind of habits do you have? To follow Jesus means going the way he went. A path not of earthly privilege, earthly honor, and earthly pleasure. Rather, going the way of humility. Following him in the way of death to self. I didn't say it, y'all. Jesus did. Why? Because Jesus was absolutely committed to doing everything for the glory of God. And he commends us saying, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross, a willingness to die for him, die to self, and follow me. When we choose to follow him, we too commit ourselves to live our lives for the glory of God and the glory of God only. Now listen, y'all, that doesn't mean that you don't have fun. Man, the Christian life is the funnest of the lives. It doesn't mean you don't have joy. It doesn't mean that you can't enjoy security in your life. But it just does mean that everything you do, Everything that you say, everything that you dream of is for the glory of God. And Jesus says that his Father will honor us if we follow him in this way.
I read a statement by a man named John Vianney. And John said, if you're ever led to do something for the glory of God that you really don't want to do, if you're led to do something for the glory of God that really you kind of dislike, if you're ever led to do something for the glory of God that is way out of your comfort zone, say this. Father, I offer you this thing that I dislike. I offer you this thing that is way out of my comfort zone in honor of the moment that your son died for me. Father, Teaching a pre-K through second grade life group is not something particularly that I'd like to do. Father, teaching a pre-K to second grade life group uh, is something that would be pretty difficult for me. Father, leading a pre-K to second grade life group is something that is so far out of my comfort zone I can't even see it. But I'm going to do it in honor of the moment that Jesus died for me. Yes, we're still searching. And I believe that the person that the Lord has selected is in this room. So today, not only are we offering an invitation for you to be eternally saved from the penalty of your sin, I mean, you'll never regret that, I promise you, but we're also inviting you to be a true Christ follower. And in so doing, friend, you're also being invited to do something that you may not want to do. You're being invited to lose your life for the sake of Jesus. I'll make no joke about it. It's a, it's a life of no excuses. It's a life of no limits. But it's also a life of no regrets. If anyone serves him, let them follow him. And where he is, there his servant will be also. If anyone serves Jesus, if anyone follows Jesus, him, her, will the Father honor. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven. Mm-hmm.